welcome to Alex Toth in Depth. This is Paul Fricke, cartoonist, comics professor, and resident Toth nut. In the uh, first episode, I tried to offer up an overview and introduction to Toth's work and why he was so important in the history of visual storytelling and uh, character design. In episode two, I offered up a list of the top 10 Toth stories to read uh, and take in and enjoy. In this episode, we cover five stories of Toth to study. Uh, these are comics tales that I think hold up well enough as stories, but aren't my first choice as stories, but uh, are just uh, incredible pieces of work that you can uh, dig into and find new things in uh, again and again and again. So let's dig in. I can't really start an episode like this without kicking it off with uh, Toth's Crush Gardenia from 1953. This was published by Standard Comics in Who's Next Number 5. It's a crime tale, and uh, it almost has a, the story anyway, has a almost documentary kind of feel, a, a sad tale of a, of a young guy who, who uh, is disturbed and, and uh, cannot avoid a life of crime and murder. This story when I first saw it reprinted in black and white in 1986, knocked my socks off. And in every uh, era that it's being reintroduced and reprinted, I think it stands up well. To me, it looks fresh um, in 53 when Toth did it. It looks fresh if you would put it side by side with like Jaime Hernandez's Love and Rockets work uh, starting in the uh, early to mid 80s. It looks uh, like it could be a style or approach that's used for black and white indie comics from around the, the same time or into the 90s. And it looks like uh, it could be fresh now. It, Toth has a way of being modern in almost any era he's working in for the most part, and sometimes even postmodern. Now, instead of doing a an approach on this was that was super realistic, and um, and a documentary style, Toth instead decided to go for something that was more abstract and psychological and emotional. He, for this story, is laying down uh, black areas as he does through most of his career and most of his work. But he's also uh, inking it himself, and instead of using a brush, he decided to go with a, a, a pen nib. And of course, be, being Toth, just any old pen nib wouldn't do. He actually used a, uh, a B6 lettering nib and then filed it to customize it and make it his own to, to get his own look on it. Um, so it has a chiseled kind of uh, flat line look with a little give and play. But the B6, uh, unlike the C-series, I think this is Speedball, is a round uh, nib, unlike the C, which is kind of a, a, f a flat thing. And, and instead of just using C, he used the B and modified it. He gets an incredible line on this. You'll see, uh, if you study this piece, that he is, you know, not connecting all lines. He is not uh, outlining all uh, objects or figures. He's letting the eye finish the piece in many ways, dropping things out. And then he's letting uh, black areas bleed into each other, meaning like somebody's hair uh, all in black will bleed into a black background. Uh, and he's going there for more abstract shapes. He's in, in terms of psychological effect and drama, he is drawing these characters in different ways. Some of the characters are naturalistic. Some of them are pretty. Some of them, uh, like uh, Johnny, uh, the main character, uh, looks disturbed and troubled throughout the whole piece. And then a couple of doctors or psychiatrists that he deals with, uh, Toth intentionally draws them with really large heads and large foreheads with these pinched little compressed faces in the middle. This was all intentional in his part. Now, when I've showed this to other people or students, they think some of that stuff looks weird, but I, I think it, it works uh, very well. Uh, and again, all these characters that he's drawing are varied and, and very interesting and, and pack a punch. He's doing stuff here as well with how he chooses to tell the story from panel to panel. 
there are some very, to me, avant-garde and different kinds of, of looks to this where he is focusing in on certain actions in ways and cropping tight on certain scenes that I don't think a lot of cartoonists in the day or for a long time were, were doing. He, he focuses in on actions and drops out uh, background detail and, and characters and, and, and gets your eye focusing instead on what the point of view is um, and what the actions are. And it's really powerful stuff. Now, there's a few quibbles I could make about this story, which I might do in a, in a, a deeper dive. But it's a clean, abstract, uh, powerful piece throughout the whole thing. He's doing things with the foreground and the background. There's hot emotional stuff uh, with the characters, a great character interaction. And there's really not a bad panel in this story. The story itself is a little... Uh, Pat, it's not a bad story by any means, but, oh, it's a little different in these times, I suppose. The uh, For some reason, the characters, uh, a couple of the characters who are just upset with Johnny's behavior, like just flat out punch him to provoke him. And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> is there another way you two dudes could have handled that? <laughs> maybe he, maybe there's no way to stop this guy, but maybe, maybe you uh, provoked him a little bit and, and, uh, I would guess that as the psychiatrist in the story is uh, asking for uh, better uh, treatment and different ways to handle a character like this, it's still a, a worthwhile story to read and it's fresh anytime you look at it. And I go back to it time and time again. So I would uh, strongly encourage that you, uh, you dig in and, and, and learn so much from this piece, The Crushed Gardenia. Uh, second on my list is my favorite of all the Dell comics that he did. This is a, a Disney TV show adaptation called Clint and Mac. With Clint and Mac, it, it tells about uh, an American family and an American boy who are staying in England, and then he befriends uh, a younger British boy. And, uh, and of course, they have adventures. Now, uh, this ran as a TV serial in uh, the late 50s on uh, the Mickey Mouse Club, and it's fairly nondescript, uninspired stuff. There's nothing wrong with it, but it, it's not doing much. The comics adaptation actually is um, a, a much better read. Some of the things in the TV show uh, seem to be stripped out for the comics script um, and story, um, and you jump right into it. But it, it's actually an engaging adventure tale to read, and though it didn't make my top 10 list, this is a, a fun, well-told story. In my view, Toth's approach to this was to uh, riff off of illustrator Robert Fawcett's approach to illustration and then put it into storytelling and, and into comics. The, the look itself has, it's a naturalistic look, but it's not realistic. Some of his Dell stuff from that period or later uh, in the into the early 60s is kind of rushed and hacked it's still solid stuff and and reads well and you know he things could be in a lot of cases illustrated and overdrawn by other by other artists and uh, toth doesn't do that he just hits kind of a middle sweet spot on this story and it just looks great it looks great it, it's not really cartoony it's not real real really realistic he's dropping blacks throughout the whole thing and it looks great. And it's pretty well colored, too. Um, Dell had a, a good uh, track record of doing decent, stripped down, again, printed on poor newsprint color. And, uh, and it works pretty well and doesn't distract and, uh, and is kind of subdued, muted uh, coloring. The storytelling here for Toth is clear. Um, he introduces you to the, uh, the London streets as the characters you know, are weaving their way through it. The characters he draws in this are very interesting and varied. Again, they almost, they're so lively um, and slightly exaggerated that they could, uh, you know, be characters from like a Dickens novel or something. It's, it's kind of fun. And again, he makes all these scenes that are kind of flat and boring in the, in what I've seen of the, the TV show. Uh, very interesting and, and a fun, engaging read. He, uh, is in this tale again, uh, dropping backgrounds out sometimes and dropping out borders. So he does open panels occasionally. He uh, has a strong sense of design throughout with incredible uh, angles 
and you know, kind of a diagonal uh, axis instead of an X or a Y axis, straight up vertical or a horizontal. And he's doing that throughout the whole story. He also, uh, like Crush Gardenia, has a way of cropping his panels and overlapping characters and objects in front of each other to bring depth and add interest to the compositions, but also to focus your eye on what's most important in the panel. There are objects and actions throughout this entire story that he directs your eye to, sometimes overtly, but usually in very clever and subtle ways. There's some pages in here that are just superb, and I will feature them uh, in another episode, or maybe uh, check some, you know, follow my uh, Alex Toth in depth uh, Instagram account, uh, and I'll highlight some of these when the episode uh, drops. The uh, there are some portions of this story, and again, Toth, I think in this case is using a brush for a lot of the work, where it's kind of impressionistic how he drops shadows. Um, into the backgrounds on figures on objects and drop shadows in the foreground is just incredible and it's tough to pull off and, and he just does it naturally and he does it in a way that kind of paints the picture he gives you the impression of light and shadow and he does all that where there's still depth and mass to everything and in perspective it's kind of amazing uh, how he pulls it off there's incredible sequences where he drapes a lot of the uh, the, the scene in uh, black and in shadow. Um, there's scenes uh, at the dock or underneath the dock where he's using perspective incredibly. He's he's drawing not only shadow but also water with in, in impressionistic ways. And again, recall one of his heroes, uh, Noel Sickles, whose work, if you haven't seen it, you should check out. Um, some of my favorite Toth panels of all time are in this uh, story. And, you know, again, you can read it um, and enjoy it, and then you can unpack it and study it. Uh, the character drawing in here is great. And, you know, whatever he's drawing, cars, uh, buildings, the uh, the city, interiors of, uh, of, uh, of rooms, they're all done seemingly effortlessly. They look like they're spot on and researched, but it also just looks like he knows what he's doing uh, and it's in his head and he's laying it all down. There's a plane too in the last page, uh, you know, as one of Toth's favorite things to draw for all of you to enjoy as well. So check out Clint and Mac, uh, to me, the the best of many good ones from that he did for Dell Comics. Uh, moving on, to my next choice would be the cartoons comic strips that Toth drew for Miller Publishing in 1964 and 1965. Uh, these again have all been collected in a book called One for the Road by Awad Publishing. Uh, and these uh, originally appeared in magazines like Big Daddy Roth, uh, Drag Cartoons, Hot Rod Cartoons, um, and the like. Um, this is a great book. Um, if you haven't, if you want to check it out in a little more depth, Cartoonist Kayfabe has a an episode where Ed Pisker and Jim Rugg cover this and, and flip through the pages. If you want to see more of it there, that's a good episode, maybe 20 uh, minutes or so long. And uh, they call this um, the best Toth book uh, ever. And I'm not sure I agree with that completely, but it's uh, a really good one. It's light fair in regards to the reading. Um, it's humorous, and it looks like Toth is just having fun on the page with this. He's experimenting in many ways with, uh, again, again, this was printed in black and white, so he's experimenting with a variety of ways to handle tone. He's dropping black and white areas and negative space uh, all the way throughout in very graphic ways. Uh, and in regards to the tone, he's handling it in a variety of ways as well. There's, he's doing simple flat half tone. He's doing cross hatch. Uh, he's doing. He uses a dua shade or craft tint for some of the stories, and sometimes a combination of those. He's using texture and pattern throughout the entire thing. And boy, oh boy, this is uh, fun to read. You can also see that in some of the cases in these stories, he's using like a uh, a razor blade. Uh, to wipe things out or to get some uh, splashy or uh, action effect 
uh, for movement and such, or just to rough things up at the edges. And uh, it's, it's really incredible stuff. Toth wrote um, a bunch of these in here and, you know, his cleverness and his wordplay um, and his gags are evident and all work mostly. And, um, and it's really, <laughs> they're really fun reads actually. Um, and they hold up well. I think he wasn't in his head so much on these because it was playful. I, my guess is he took this on because it had a lot to do with hot rods and cars, uh, which were, hep at the time these were done um and he could lean into it and have fun and i bet you because he could uh you know write and draw them all himself he had pretty much complete control over he want what he wanted to do the publisher in the introduction says that uh his regular uh, rate for artists at the time was 50 dollars a page and uh for his previous uh publications and in this case he upped it to 75 because uh, he discovered that, you know, artists would do, uh, to do comics, you needed letterers and writers and all that stuff. And Toth took these on for 75 a page. Uh, that sounds like not much now. And, and it sounds like from the publisher's point of view that he thought that was a steal to get a, an artist of Toth's caliber on it. That 75 a page, uh, when adjusted for inflation, comes up to about 600 just a little over 600 a page now. That's much more than a lot of artists get for drawing uh, comics as well. And my guess would be that if a lot of artists had the opportunity to draw comics for 600 a page, um, they would uh, they would go at it, <laughs> and uh, and happily so. Now, some uh, my favorite stuff in here is the Big Daddy Roth stuff, which is cartoony and fun and abstract and he's just going crazy on the page there's some of my favorite toth pages are in uh these big daddy roth stories he's they're they're a little more cartoony they're bold and the what he's doing with the figure and the body language in these is just amazing and you can tell you know uh, unlike some of his earlier work which looks like he's you know trying to be buttoned down with the drawing um, and even while simplifying being realistic he is letting all, out all stops here, and he has a natural facility for cartooning. In these stories, again, uh, as I mentioned in the first episode, he stacks up, I think, well with just about anybody who did uh, cartooning for Mad Magazine. Unlike the Daddy Roth stories, um, some of the stuff he does that is in the mad mode, uh, you know, straight up um parodies are not my favorites in the book um there's also some stuff in here with a character called the uh, dragula which are okay but not my favorites he's got but he's got a nice gag in here about the beatles getting old that's pretty darn funny it's obvious he's not a fan of uh, the beatles uh, at the height of their early uh teen pop popularity in uh in 64 or 5 um what Toth predicted in there uh, came true. All these aging rockers who said they wanted to die before they got old, um, uh, got old and are on stage and still strutting around. Those who are still with us, and most of them, a lot of them are. Um, but it doesn't seem like he was a fan at the time. Um, stylistically, he's doing a lot of things in here that are all over the map. Again, he's doing bold, simple, cartoony stuff. He's doing things that are more realistic where craft tint and modeling are over the top and just look gorgeous. And then he's doing things that are kind of in between. And guess what? All of it works. Just about all of it. Every page works. Um, some of my favorite stuff in here is a series of stories, some of which he wrote and some of which he didn't, called Granny McGo. And all of these stories are really fun reads. Uh, the characters, a blast, this old lady with the uh, with her uh, old car. And um, in these stories especially, he's using, I think, craft tint on some, that duo shade I talked about. But he's also doing, he's using pattern and texture on these in ways that are just so darn sophisticated. Um, it's beautiful stuff. Uh, this is a book I would recommend anybody pick up and have uh, in their studio. 
Oh, you can see in, in some of these too, in some of these uh, Granny McGough stories, he's got these younger, beefier um, uh, mechanics and such um, who predate the uh, Hot Wheels uh, characters and, and crew um, very much of the same mold. And those were, you know, not quite, not seven, eight years later. Um, so he's doing something, some things here that recur later on. And again, he's drawing dragsters and cars throughout here and having a blast. There's lots of movement on these pages. They're very dynamic. And I think this is a great fit for comics uh, and a great model for comics because I think a lot of times people can get uh, a little stiff or, um, uh, oh, a little bit in their head and precious about finished comics pages. And the more we can get comic uh, artists and cartoonists loosening up um, and letting it fly a little bit more, um, the, the better uh, the content, I think, and the better the reading experience uh, for everybody. So pick up uh, One for the Road, the cartoons book, or look for them online and uh, soak it up and take it in. It's great stuff. Uh, next up is one of my favorite um, looking uh, Toth stories um, called If I Were King. This was published in 1974 in Sorcery Number no. 9 uh, by a small publisher called Red Circle, for which uh, he did uh, some Fox stories that I mentioned in Episode 2 um, just a handful of years later. Uh, in If I Were King, he's doing things here that are really, really graphic and, and beautiful and nice. And he's hitting a sweet spot here again between realism and cartooniness. The, in the first page, he, his uh, semi-splash or opening or title shot is uh, graphic and, and pretty. This is a beautifully colored uh, comic. I'm not sure who did it. Um, it was written by Marvin Channing, who I can't track down anywhere else, and I, I don't really know the name. And it's a, a decent enough story. Um, it's just about this guy who wants to be a young, popular dude who's on TV everywhere, and a fortune teller lady helps him become that. He finds out it's not all it's cracked up to be, and then uh, and that the guy's life is in danger because he's into iffy things um, with uh, crime-related people and and wants to get out of it, and she turns him back to himself, only to discover at the end that the uh, the guy he wanted to be is killed at the end. It's kind of abrupt at the end, and I think story-wise, this could have been punched up, um, but it still reads all right um, as a story. And it and but Toth's work on this is out of this world. It is top notch, and there is not a bad panel in this entire story. Um, he's again dropping blacks all the way through. Uh, the story, but he has this naturalistic cartoony look that is really working great. He's moving the point of view around uh, in, you know, overhead shots, uh, slightly below. Um, he's using uh, different angles all the way through, uh, close-ups, uh, long shots, and it's all working great. Um, sometimes he uses open uh, panel borders, uh, in, every, in every, uh, every so often in here. And one thing he's doing, uh, is something I've seen John Workman and others do with their lettering where the, uh, where the borders of the balloon meet the edges or the borders of the panel and then open up. So there is no, there's not a balloon within a panel. It, the balloon, uh, itself forms the edge of the panel. And then the uh, the text settles into that area in that space in a more open way. And that's a trick I picked up from Workman. Uh, Workman started doing that, I think, in the, I don't know, early 80s, maybe before, I'm not sure. But I've used that ever since my entire career. And Toth is doing that here in 1974. I think some Italian artists uh, or letterers, whoever worked with Sergio Tappi, uh, did that as well. And that may be where workman picked it up um but i see the toth is using that here and to great effect i think it just cleans things up and i would encourage uh, cartoonists and comics makers to use that uh, you got to be careful so that things don't run into each other but it's really something that that can work well and, and toth here is using his balloons in a very angular uh, fashion 
with uh, diagonals into it. So it has a sharper look than the typical round panels, um, but it really looks nice and it opens things up a little, uh, a, a little bit and, and looks great. Um, the character work here is great. All the characters are varied and there's eh, four main, four or five main characters in here, maybe six. Uh, they're all distinctive. They're all great quick reads and they all, uh, service the story and move things along at a glance you know exactly what they're about the 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 gypsy fortune teller lady is just amazing um and but the my favorite thing for all the great things in this story my favorite thing he does here is with this chiaroscuro effect or what he's doing with uh pattern uh throughout there are some panels in here that are just going to kill you if you've not seen this before um, and he's doing it all and he's adding with it some kind of texture with a grease pencil or China marker, um, throughout, uh, they're just beautiful panels, beautiful pages, um, and incredible cartooning all the way through. And the storytelling is super solid. It's, it, it might be a story that a lot of people don't talk about when considering Toth, but it is in my five top to study and uh, I'd strongly encourage you can you check it out. Um, so if I were King from 1974. Uh, lastly, in our list is one that I could not uh, go without. Uh, this is Battle Flag of the Foreign Legion from 1950. This was published in a short lived comic from DC Comics called Danger Trail. And it is a, a historic uh, comic it was extremely influential. It easily could have been on my top 10 list. Um, uh, I think the story is very good. It's a heroic war tale uh, about uh, courage, and it's really well told. It, to me, it, it doesn't resonate for me as much personally as those I chose for the, uh, the top 10 to read, but it easily could have been on there, and, I'm, and who knows, maybe some people would disagree with me and think it should have been there. Um, but Battle Flag is a seminal work and um, very important in the history of comics and, and, a, uh, and a great read um, on its own. The, uh, he, Toth was making strides. He, he, again, I mentioned in an earlier episode that he worked with this famous artist school stuff and took in their lessons and worked them. And it seems to really have hit in 1950. You can see it in some of his earlier work um, with stories like Toreador from Texas and Appointment in Paris, where it's very evident. Those stories are okay. Uh, I may cover them in a future episode, um, but the uh, the look in them is very graphic, and you can see that he's leveling up big time. Even before that, in earlier 1950, there's a story called The Case of the Oily Worm. Uh, it's a Sierra Smith tale, and I swear in this one you can actually see him getting better with every page. There's some things he's doing in pages that look very similar to what he was doing uh, just the year previous or in the in his teens in the uh, latter part of the of the 40s decade. Um, but with this one, it looks like he's improving page to page. So the last couple page, he's just knocking it out of the out of the park and. Um, uh, it's incredible stuff. So you can see that he that he's already trying to get better and already getting better in the uh, in the early parts of 1950. And then Battle Flag is where it all really starts to come together. It's a it's a, a good tale told from the uh, point of view of the Foreign Legion Battle Flag. Um, a you know it, what can seem like a silly device, uh, whether it's in movies or prose or in comics. Um, but it works well enough. And he, and Toth makes it, uh, a prominent, uh, graphic element throughout this story. Then, uh, the battle flag is in the narration boxes and he's using different kinds of points of view or angles to give us a different look on the page or within the panels of the flag. Um, and, uh, and, and it's nicely done. Um, the, what he does with picture making in this story is kind of incredible. Uh, his compositions are, uh, very interesting with tons of depth. Uh, and, and again, when you're laying down blacks in a comic or in, in any kind of illustration, things can go wrong quickly. 
and things can get very flat. And he finds tons of ways to avoid that. It's very, very dicey to try to pull off what he does or things like it with laying blacks um, next to each other, on top of each other, bleeding into each other. And he uses it to great effect and you're not lost in any of the storytelling or any of the shots and you're not um, uh, uh, visually confused. Um, and in many cases, with his laying down of blacks, he sets the tone and mood, but he also is um, uh, highlighting and focusing in on certain elements and objects that are important to the story. Um, he uses black here throughout in on objects and shadows and draping of shadows across, uh, you know, sands and uh, the desert, um, in, in interiors, and then a lot on the... Uh, uh, the outfits of the soldiers in this story. Uh, he, with all of that going on, his line is really clean and precise, um, and he's merging that kind of clean line with the the graphic spotting of blacks throughout. There's just a startling look. It's it's a fairly well colored story, um, but um, it's really well drawn. I mean, geez, all his drawing is spot on here, um, and. Uh, it, it, it just has a great mood, a great drama throughout, and uh, and smartly done. Uh, when other artists or publishers saw this, they're like, whoa, what's this guy doing? He was like, I don't know, how old? 21 when he drew this? So every a lot of people in the industry were like, oh, oh, this guy's a genius, what he's doing, and started following his lead. Archie Goodwin, who he later worked with, said that Battle Flag was – the influential comic uh, during this period and kind of set a new standard that everyone else went after. Um, while I think this is an important story in comics history and it really holds up well on its own, um, it Bernie Kriegstein later cited this story as being the one that influenced him a lot, especially when working on uh, Master Race, which I think is a better and more important uh, comic in comics history. Um, but it's probable that we wouldn't have Master Race without uh, Toth's battle flag. It's just, it probably wouldn't exist. Because why we know Master Race isn't because of Al Feldstein's story, although it's good and well done. It's because of how Krigstein uh, drew it and how he broke it down uh, graphically and, and, and did a different uh, you know take on rhythms and a graphic look in his work. It just wouldn't exist without Battle Flag. So uh, there's still, even though this was drawn now 70 years ago, there's still tons that you can learn from it. Um, and um, we may do an in-depth uh, episode on this one um, in the future. Uh, there is a uh, uh, reprints of this with some original art in the, I think, second, or maybe it's in the first big book, uh, Alex Toth, um, Genius Isolated. I think it's in that first one. Um, so you can check that out. And then, of course, you can find this and all the other stories um, online. So those are my top five uh, Toth stories to study. But trust me, I have a long list, and there will be more episodes like this where we'll pick out more gems uh, of Toths uh, to take in and study. So that's all the time we're giving to this episode. This again is Paul Fricky for the Alex Toth In-Depth Show. Comments, questions, or compliments, please email paul at opalo.com or at Alex Toth In-Depth on Instagram, where you can follow, share, comment, and like daily posts. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify, and a plethora of podcast platforms. Just type in Alex Toth In-Depth leave a quick positive review to make it easier for others to find the show. There's also an enhanced video version of the show on YouTube. So subscribe to that channel so you don't miss an episode. Tell your friends. Until next time, go with Toth. And remember, strip it all down to essentials and draw the hell out of what's left.